Okay, so we have around nine people who were from previous workshop. That's great. Okay, come, let me just uh, start with the content. So, yeah, um, hang on. Uh, okay. Yeah, so um, you can find the slides at this link, bit.ly slash hs hyphen py auto slides. Uh, but don't worry, uh, I think after the end of the whole workshop, we'll send you guys the link to the slides and the materials as well. So don't feel like rushed to go and like take down the links of the slides or whatsoever. Okay, we'll be, yeah, we'll be like sharing with you all the materials that we're using here. So don't worry about that. Okay, so let me just recap on what Hacker School is about. Okay, so Hacker School is really just a part of NUS Hackers uh, programs. Okay, our object objective is, is really just to get you started on programming and making stuff so that you can move on to start with your own projects. So like uh, the type of skills that we teach in the workshops that are things like uh, automation with Python and like uh, HTML, CSS and like uh, machine learning and etc. So these are skills that, you know, we, we can teach you the skills, but the skills are really just to help you so that you can work on projects that you're passionate about and you can just start hacking on your own. Okay. So just uh, about us and uh, yeah, uh, today we have, I'll be teaching uh, part of the workshop and uh, Yi Tao will be teaching part of the workshop as well. We are both from the NUS Hackers core team and uh, we are both year two com science. And uh, we also have uh, Jing Yan here from the NUS Hackers core team who's here to like help us to answer questions and become like a teaching ex assistant today. So if you have any questions, just feel free to just ask in the chat. Uh, we have people around answering questions. Yeah. Um, other than that, me and Yi uh, we have done various like Python related, I would say it's Python related internships. It's just like data science related internships where we are required to use like Python extensively. So we really thought that it was, it's, this hacker school is a good opportunity for us to just share with you like what we've learned, what we've used and how we've used like Python to help us in our, in our work or even in our life. In a few of the examples I'll show you guys later, uh, are actually how I use Python to help myself in my life, like in things that you never expected Python will help, okay? So again, the workshop objective is really just to continue where we left off on the previous workshop. The previous workshop, we really taught a very simple, basic Python workshop, where we, it's really just to get people who don't know programming started on programming so that they can understand like the more fun content we're gonna go through today. Today's workshop is gonna be really fun because we're gonna show you some real life examples on how we can use Python to just make stuff like easier, make stuff better for yourself, okay? And we're gonna introduce some common Python tools and libraries. Uh, Python tools like Jupyter Notebook and uh, third party libraries, okay? And so you can look at this comic at the right hand side. This comic at the right hand side is an XKCD comic. Uh, the, the fact is that when we do automation, right, we always think that it would be like, in theory, you know, like we just automate it and then like our work just becomes a lot lower and we spend a lot less time on it. But you know, some, a lot of the times, right, the, in actual fact, it actually doesn't be, it's not like that. Like uh, you tell yourself that, oh, you want to automate it, but you actually spend like way too much time automating it and end up debugging your code like a lot of times that you actually spend up, like spend more time like working on your automation than like doing the actual work. So. You know, like this is just a funny comic that I wanted to share that we thought was quite relevant, especially like amongst all the Python, like people who do like all the automation scripts and stuff. All right. So let me just uh, set some expectations, okay, for the workshop. So I'm sure all of you guys, you all signed up for this workshop because you all saw automation with Python and you guys were like, like, so you, know, you guys sound, saw the word automation, you yeah, were like so interested, right? Yeah, like, Automation, is Python gonna help me mop my floor and like feed my dog after I attend this workshop? And the fact is, no. Okay, so let me just define what is our definition of Python and what, no, our definition of automation and like what we really want to convey to you via this workshop today. And uh, of course, the title really is quite clickbaity. Okay, when you see like automation with Python, you just think that, oh, this is a workshop that will like make my life a lot easier. But the fact is that, it's, it is clickbaity, but I, we can't really find a better word to properly encapsulate that what, what we'll be teaching today, okay? In fact, uh, we sort of define automation in this, like, uh, we sort of define automation as things that, uh, you know, using Python to help us do things that we'll otherwise be unable to do or find it too difficult to do without Python, okay? So 
you also find that automation is a very personal thing. So something that you want automated might not be something I want automated and vice versa. Something I want automated might not be something that you want automated. Okay, and the examples that we're going to show you today are real life examples that me and Itao have used before and they might not apply to you and you might not agree with some of them. And that's fine because what we, what we want to demo today and what we want you to take in are the skills and the concept behind these like automation projects that we started. And these, are, these skills and concepts are the things that will help you automate something that makes sense to you personally. Okay, again, automation is a very personal concept. So just to set some context, we, so we are really not like a coding bootcamp. So we are not aiming to be comprehensive. Okay, because like when you go for coding bootcamps, you sign up for coding bootcamps, they sort of like they just teach you like everything you need to know about language. But okay, today's workshop is really just a two hour workshop and there's a lot to cover in this two hour workshop. So me and Itao, when we design our materials, we actually like thought a lot about in this short period of time, what is the best content that we can show you to make the uh, make you like get started on your own projects as soon as possible and uh, let you enjoy the good stuff uh, as soon as possible and um, we really just distill out the content that is the most fun and uh, a lot of things that we go through might be pretty quick and like a lot of things like might not be very clear to you guys and that's normal okay because like if things are not too clear to you guys we're just introducing you to the con concept so that you guys can explore uh, it yourself on your own after the workshop. But this workshop should give you enough ideas so that you can just start on something on your own. Okay, now that I've set the expectations already, uh, we're just gonna go through the outline of what we're gonna go through today. Okay, so first, the first part of the, the workshop is gonna be run by Itao, and we're gonna go through things like third party packages with Anaconda. So last week's workshop, we really like, just made use of the Python and its Python's language features, but today we're going to introduce you like running other people's code to make things easier for you to write your own code. Okay, and then we're going to go through other language features that we didn't cover last week, such as objects and classes and like reading and writing files. Okay, so one, two and three, uh, objects and classes, reading and writing files, they form sort of the foundation before we can move on to very cool stuff such as bug image manipulation. And then uh, I'll be covering things like web scraping with beautiful soup and like downloading YouTube videos. Okay, so without further ado, let me just uh, pass the time over to Itao, where he will just start with the Python package manager. Okay, okay so um, now we talk about um, Python package managers. So um, in, in Python comes with like a very extensive standard library that like comes with a lot of like packages for handling date time, like math functions, and also like accessing the internet. So yeah, because this Python comes with like a batteries included kind of philosophy. So like they want everything to be like more or less there without having to do any installation. But even even so, like sometimes you need the party packages because um, sometimes they make like the certain ways of like doing things easier. And also you might need like additional functionality that's not in included in the um, standard library. So yeah, if, if you want to use like any of the third party li li uh, libraries, you need to install them before they can be used. So like there's generally there's two ways to install third party packages. So the first way is like using pip. So from Python 3.4 onwards, pip is comes with like the default installation of Python. Um, yeah, but we, in this course, we actually don't recommend like newcomers to use pip because uh, if you start installing like different um, li libraries and then they might, you might have some problems like having uh, some, it's, 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 it, can, it, can, it can run into some issues. Yeah, so uh, we recommend like using Anaconda because uh, installing Anaconda itself comes with a lot of like uh, commonly used the party libraries and also it comes with a uh, environment manager. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we will go through today. But if, if, you, if you are really familiar with PIP, and you want to use Pip, we can also use that. Um, okay, so uh, now we briefly go through like how, how to install Anaconda. So basically you go to this website and then um, for, for you, you download the, the appropriate version based on your OS. And so for Windows and Mac, you can use the GUI um, and just follow the instructions. Yeah, and for Linux, 
or for the Mac command line, you can uh, just navigate to the downloaded.sh file and then you just run the command uh, bash and the, the sh file here. So okay, I'll do, I'll do a, like a quick demo. Um, so this is like my uh, a Windows VM. Um, so, so this is the website. I just like scroll down all the way to the end and you can see like this. So most computers today are 64 bit. So uh, just download the one. And then for Linux, use the one that's, it will probably be x86. Yeah, so after you download, like say on Windows, you, you, get, you get this like, installer here. So you just uh, double click it. And then uh, you just, uh, you, can, you, can, you can choose either one. Yeah, and so, so you you're, you're go through this like uh, add anaconda to my path environment variable. So what, what this does is it will, uh, if, if you take this, then you can uh, use the conda command from your command prompt. Yeah, if you don't take this, then you will only be able to use the conda command and the, and the, and the Python command all this from the anaconda prompt. So um, yeah, so after, after you, you do this, you install. So, it, it, I, uh, so, so if you don't know whether to take this, I recommend you just take this, yeah. Um, okay, so after you install, right? Okay, let's say, let's say you didn't take this, so you can just search for Anaconda Prom, if, if, yeah, and, and then you can type in Conda and it should give you this, uh, this, this like output here, yeah. If you, add, if you add it to the path variable, right, you can also run, run it from the command line. So um, you type in Conda here, yeah, then, then you will you're, you're run. So, okay, now let's go back to the slides. Okay, um, so, so in this course, we'll talk a bit about objects. So like, I'll try to, because in our previous course, we didn't really co cover objects and classes. So yeah, we'll just try to demystify them a bit, like give a quick overview of what objects are. So an object is like a programming term for like a bundle of related variables and functions. Yeah, so it, it, we call that in the previous course, we talked about variables and functions, right? Yeah, so sometimes we run like a certain like related variables and functions that belong to maybe say a, a, a certain con like a concept to be like bundled together. So it's like, it's kind of like bundling in the same concept of bundling statements together in a function. Like you bundle like uh, variables and functions together in an object. So, yeah, so in programming, there's this jargon called attributes and methods. So, variables and functions in an object, they are just, so variables in an object, they are known as attributes. And functions in an object, they are known as methods. So, it's just like additional jargon. Yeah. So, in, in Python, right, everything is an object. So, what this means is that even basic data types, like strings, booleans, in, integers, they are all objects. So if you, if you like, so, so not, in, some, in some languages, like there might be this concept of a primitive data type, but yeah, in Python, everything is an object. So if you, if you type in like, say uh, this integer here, equals to 45, and then you can actually assess this, uh, this attribute called the numerator. So that, and then it will return 45. And there's also like an attribute called the denominator. It will, it will return one. Yeah, and in, so in, in, in a string object, right, there's, there's a lot of like, additional methods like capitalize, upper, yeah. So this, these are like methods. That, so, so it's like you, can, you, call, you call object methods using the, the dot operator. Yeah, so um, in, you, in this case, it's s dot upper will just capitalize the whole string for you, yeah. Okay, so we will not, okay, I'll talk, I'll talk briefly about class, but you don't really need to know how to write your own class like as of now. Yeah, so a class is kind of like, uh, a blueprint for creating an object. So, um, defining a new class is kind of like creating your own new data type. So, like you know, we have strings, boolean, and stuff. But sometimes you want your your own like more complex data type. Like say, uh, like, like say you want to create a, a data type for uh, maybe uh, a, 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 that represents a, a car or something. Yeah. Then then you inside the the, the the data type you want like uh, maybe the, the the name of the car. How much fuel it has in it. So, th so those are like, those data types. Like so it's like a more complex data type that contains like more primitive data types. So, yeah. So what what's an object? What's a class? So an object is just like a single instance of the class. Yeah. So it's like 
the class is like a blueprint and then the object is just like after you create an object from blueprint the object is just an instance of the of the blueprint so in this workshop right uh, we won't be creating any classes because usually like in, in real life like 99 percent of the time you usually don't need to write your own class you just use like the classes that are provided in the third party libraries and you just like use their functionality yeah um okay, so so this is like just briefly to run through the syntax you don't have to memorize this and you don't have to like uh it, it's just like for for in case in case like it causes any like in case you run across it in like future so like um so you have this class keyword and usually class names are capitalized so usually if you import classes from third party libraries right they'll be have a capitalized name whereas like uh variable, like other like uh attributes or like functions they will be uh in small small letters so you you see like this init it, so it stands for initializer so it's like the class con what, what is called a class constructor so uh it's basically you call this method to create an instance of the class yeah so you can see that this class has two attributes called name and age and also like you see like all the class methods have a self keyword in front of it so this is just basically for the method itself to uh, have a reference to the instance of the class but when you call the when you call the uh, method itself right you don't need to provide the, the, the self yeah the, the, the self keyword so it's in, in the next slide we'll go through this so as you can see like this this is the class that we create like the previous year right so you, you create a, a instance of a class by calling like the the constructor which is basically like a bracket like a, the class name followed by a bracket and then uh, you, you notice that you just ignore the self keyword so the name is the first uh the first argument and then after that the age is the second argument so this is how you create an instance of a class yeah so next time if you see like uh like anything that starts with a, a big a big capital letter and then bracket right then that means it's like creating a class yeah i think you know sorry creating an object from a class yeah so um so you can see like this is how you call a method from a class so you you see how you, you already created this object and you assign it to this variable called dot one and then you, you call using the dot assessor you call the description method so it will return you you, you run this function here yeah so which, which returns you this string so uh the, the 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 self is just like referring to the the, the instance itself so self dot name is self dot h dot eso and then you can also like pass in other uh arguments like so this this one takes a second argument called sound which we can pass in here Okay, so next we'll talk about reading and writing files. Okay, so uh, before we talk about reading and writing files, we need to talk about uh, how to handle file paths like in, in programs. So in, in, in Windows, right, they have, the file paths are like usually like, they're using a backslash. So if you go to your, uh, uh, the, 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 win, the Windows, the Explorer, right, and then you copy the path from there, right, it will give you the backslash, but, um, yeah, so backslashes are a bit, a bit, uh, they are complicated to work with. So, because they don't, if if, if you write a program for like using using like uh this backslash, encode it in a string, right? Then it, it will not work for um, Mac OS and Linux because those use like forward slashes. And also like if you want to write a backslash in a string, right? You need to escape it with another backslash, or you need to make the string a raw string by using the letter R in front of the double quotes. Yeah. So okay, but, but in, in this course, like, we will not use it to do that because it's not good practice. So we will use uh, this this library called Pathly. Yeah. So okay, and also there's this concept of uh, relative and absolute paths. So absolute paths basically what it means is it starts at the root directory. So for Windows, it's usually like uh, the the C drive, the C colon backslash. And then for Mac and Linux, it's uh, usually just a slash itself, like a single slash itself. So if in a program, right, if the file path does not start at the root directory, so it means that it does not start as slash or it does not start at the, the, the C, that means it's a, it's a relative path. It's not an absolute path. So the relative path just, it will start at the, this, this thing called a current working directory. So the current working directory or CWD for short is like, the folder that you ran your program for. So if you open your terminal and then you uh, you type in, and you run your program for there, then the folder that you 
type in the command to run the program. That's called the current working directory. Okay, so there's this uh, library in the standard library called the uh, pathlib. So you, usually we just need the, this, this class from pathlib called the, the path. Yeah, so um, this we will return uh, a string with Oh, sorry, sorry. This, this, this is like a, a, a small mistake here. You will, you will not return a string with a file path. So what, what it does is basically you can create a, a path object by uh, say say like you 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 have a, a bunch of uh, what is this? For like imagine that these are folder names. So spam, bacon, and eggs. And then you just like create a new object here. And then it will, it will based on your operating system, you will automatically uh, use the correct either the forward slash or the backslash. To, to create the path. And okay, so so in, in when you use path it, right, there's this uh there's this operator that you can use called it's, it's called a slash operator. So if, if, if your if your first uh if your first uh what's that if your if your if your first value right if your first or second value is a path leap object you can use the slash operator to kind of like create a new path from there. So, so let's say uh, in this example, right, the current working directory uh, is uh, slash home slash etau, and you want to like say you want to create a, a path to this uh, to this test dot pi. So you can just like use the slash operator to to and then, and then you re you return a new object that's that has the the full path based on based on this. Yeah. So it's 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 a very handy way of uh, writing paths. Compared to like before, before the public library was introduced, you have to use like uh, the the OS uh, library to it, 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 the the syntax is a bit more com uh, complicated. So yeah, because of the order of evaluations, right? The first one of the first two values must be a path object. Yeah. So because because Python will evaluate this this uh, this uh, operation first. So either one of these two must be uh, a path object. So if you if your first two are strings right? Your first two values are strings right? Then you you get this you get this error. So like unsupported oper operand type for string. Like, so string slash string is not defined. Yeah, you need to have a path lib object slash string. Uh, okay. So in in the, in the path object right, there's this um method called glob. So glob is just like you can think of it as grabbing all the files or directory in this from this path. Yeah, so uh, say we have this path. Uh, in, in, okay, this is this is the Windows path. So like we have this path, and then we clock. After uh, you, you you provide the the it's called a regex pattern. So uh, this this star operand just basically means everything. Yeah. So if you if you clock a string star, it just means that you want all the files that are in this directory. So all the files, all the folders that are in this directory. So you see that it returns you a generator object. It, yeah, so a generator object is basically uh, it's, it, it's, it basically only contains like the the next value. So like right now it only contains the first value. It doesn't contain like all the values at once to like save memory. So, so like it's, it's just like the concept of lazy evaluation. So if you want to see all the values at once, right, you have to change it to a list or, or a tuple. Yeah, so uh, just call the in Python, there's this built-in function called list. Uh, so just like call list and then you put in the pass in the p dot clock here, and you return you the the list of paths. So you can also like besides grabbing like everything, you can also like usually in most cases you want like a specific type of path. So like say you want to have all txts or you want to have like all images like jpegs. So you can like have so. You can just pass this this regex pattern. So star dot txt. So it will just return all the files that start with any combination of letters. So star means everything. Yeah. And then it must end with the dot txt. So anything that ends with dot txt will be will be written. So if you can see, yeah, so in this example, you have this, and then it will, it will return you um, the, the paths. Okay, so um, there there are a couple, other couple methods to like to make your like uh so they may they may be useful. So, um, in a path object, there's like exists 
So if if the path exists, it return true. Like so, it, uh, it it can be it can be a file, it can be a directory. As long as the path is a valid path that you return true, and then you can also call like is file or is directory. So a directory is just another name for a folder. Yeah. Okay, so now we talk about writing to files. So in Python, there's this uh, built-in function called open. So it takes in like two arguments. So the first one is the path to the file that you want to open. It can be a relative path or it can be an absolute path. So we call that absolute path just means it starts at either slash or starts at C. So for Windows. Yeah, so in this case, we did not have, this is an absolute path. So it means that in the current working directory, there's a file called test.txt. Yeah, and also like the second argument you take is called the, the mode, like the read or write. So if you want to write, it, it takes in, you, you just put in a, a string called W. If you want to read, you just put a string called R. So in this case, we, are going, we want to write to a file. So um, you can just call F equals, so this open function will return a file object, which you assign to say a variable called F. And then you call the method called write, and you will just, you will overwrite the entire file that if it, if it already exists, right? You will overwrite the entire file. Yeah, so just take that into account. Uh, so, you, you, so if there was previously like text there, you will just replace the entire text with hello world. And after that, you, you will return the number of characters being written. And it, it's always good practice to close a file after you, you write to it. For like, um, yeah, for, for, for reasons such as memory and so like, so that other programs can access it. So it, 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 you can see like this syntax is like not the, it's, it's quite long. So it's just for understanding. Yeah, but usually in Python, we write it like this. So there's this, uh, there's this thing called a with block. So the with block, right, it will, uh, after, after the with block is finished, it will automatically close the file. And also if like there's an error here, like say that the file does not exist, right, it will also automatically close the file. And yeah, so, so this is like a much better syntax because you don't have to remember to like call f.close. You will just close it automatically. Yeah, and uh, so and you can see it's still a bit shorter. So usually this 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 is the syntax that we use for writing files, and also op for for reading files is similar. But we we call it we, use, we change the second argument to uh, r instead. And if you don't provide the second argument, the default behavior would be reading. So the, you can this is actually an optional argument. So uh, you print like just now we wrote to the file called uh, we wrote to the file hello world. And now if you print f.read, it will just return the entire text in the file as a single string. Yeah. Okay, so now we will move to the notebook. Okay, so for those of you who uh, might be new to Git, so uh, our Git workshop is next week. So if, if you guys are not familiar with Git, so you can see like there's, uh, we have this, uh, we, we, we was linked to this website just now. So you can just, download it as a zip file and after that you can you can extract you can you can extract all so you can just use this and and then you can so if you have if you're using the anaconda prompt or, or, or the windows command prompt doesn't really matter um, you just type in jupyter notebook it comes in pre-installed, so this this should run out of, out of the box. Okay, so if you unzip it in your downloads folder, right? So you just navigate it over, and you open writing files dot ipy notebook. Okay, so this is the first notebook that we'll be going through. Um, you see here that we import, so all these imports are from a standard library. You don't need to install any third party libraries yet. So um, the OS library basically has uh, a few uh, functions to, let's say, uh, make new directories or um, handle, uh, to move, rename, rename files, all these. And also like we will be using date time and also the, the path library that we, we, we went through just now. So to run a cell, just press shift enter. Yeah. So you can press shift enter and you'll, you'll just run. So here you can see that uh, our current working directory is um, is the one that, let me, let me move it out of the way. 
So our working directory is actually this folder, this folder here that we open, we open the writing files for. So this folder, automation with Python. Yeah, so this is the current, this is the working directory. And if you check, so this is downloads, and it'll be this, this, yeah, the, the notes directory will be here. So if you, if you guys haven't checked out what, what the, the data is, it's basically like a bunch of TXTs here. Yeah, this, this is the notes directory. So you can, you can see like it, it returns you like uh, this Windows path if you're running on Windows, but if you're running on like say another operating system like uh, a Mac or Linux, then you will have a slight something slightly different. So it will, it will, it will give you a POSIX path. Yeah, but it, it basically it, it works the same way. Yeah. So um, okay, let, let me move back to the Windows. Okay, so uh, you can see that we here we, we, we want to grab all the TXT files. So we uh, we call the, the glob method from the path object. And then you can check. So so the glob method, remember, we call that it returns you a generator. So you want, you want to, if you want to look at all the values at once, you need to convert it into a list. So here we convert it to a list and you can check that all the all the text files has been blocked. Also, like uh, so, so I'll, I'll I'll go for this uh, this this script is basically to so that there are these text files, and we want to add a date to the to like the first line of the text file. So um, we just quickly open the text files to inspect them. So you can see like we have a bunch of uh, a text here, but we want to let's say we want to add a date, to, like today's date to to. To the first line, so like maybe this is your diary or something, yeah. But so, so if you want to do it manually, it, it does take some time, especially if there's more than four files. So, um, what you can do is basically so in Python, there's this date time library. So, just now we from the from the date time library, we import um, uh, this sub package called date time. So, we can call date time dot today and we return you a, a, new, a, a new date time object, and then from that object. There's this function called string format time, so um, it, it basically you provide a, 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 a format string. So this this is called format string. So percentage day. So let's say you want the format to be day slash month slash year. So you just uh, put in this format string day month year. Yeah. If you want like uh, different formats, you can also like use. There's also like uh, hours, minutes, and seconds. Yeah. Okay, so you check that today's date has now been correctly formatted. It's 5th September. And okay, so now you want to insert the date. But okay, uh, for usually right, uh my 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 practice is to not overwrite files because if let's say you make a mistake and then you overwrite the existing file, and let, let's say like, you, like there's there's lots of content. So you don't want that to happen. Like sometimes like we might make a programming mistake or something. Yeah. So it's usually not a good idea to go and overwrite your existing file. So it's, it's, it's best to have a, a new output directory and, and save the, the files to the new output instead. So here we create, we, 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 we make a new path to what the output directory. And because it does not exist yet, we need to create the output directory. So in the OS library, there's this function called the make directories. So it's, it's called make dir, make D-I-R-S. So you just, you can take in a string. You can also take in a path object. So here we just straight away path, pass in the object, path object. But in some other third party libraries, they might expect a path as a string. Then you might need to convert the path object as a string. So here we can check that. So you can see if you, if you type in the current output directory, right, it's, it's, a, it's an object, it's not a string. So sometimes in a third party library, you might need to convert it to a string first. Then it will return you the string. Yeah, and so see like because Windows uses backslash, right? They you have to escape the string using another backslash. Uh, escape the backslash using another backslash. Yeah, so if not, if not, you run into problems. Okay, so you make you make the directory, and now you, you if you go back to the folder, you can see that it the directory has been uh, has been created already. So okay, so I I, I talk about what this chunk of code does. So just now we have a list of file paths. 
So we look through each of the file paths and we get. So for each of the file paths in the file paths, we open it in read mode and then we, we read it, we read all the contents of the text. So this will be a single, the, all the contents will be in a single string. And after that, we open, we open the output directory. And so in, in this file path, right, it's, it, it, it record that this is an object. So the object, right, has, has certain attributes to it. So the dot name attribute, right, refers to this node1.txt. So if you, if you go to, so if you go to like say the first, and then we call dot name, yeah, so this is not one.txt. So basically we want this string and then we want to kind of like concatenate it using this slash operator to the existing path object. So we want to open it. And then we, we open it using the right mode now. And then so we, we now we now we write it. So uh we write the today's date and then we have a we have a new line here so um so that it doesn't like just straight away like Add together without a new line up. Yeah, so and then plus the existing text that, that already that's already there. So now if you run this chunk of code, you can check that the output. So it's now the output there is like this files. And now there's a date that's in the first line for each of them. So yeah, this is just like example of writing files. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so now we'll talk about uh, image manipulation. So uh, we'll just talk about a few concepts first, then after that we'll go to the notebook. Okay, so um, so in the, usually in like image libraries, they, rec they represent images using this uh, using this concept called RGB or RGBA. There's also like other color representations like YMCK or this, but usually it's either RGB or RGBA. So it just stands for red, green, blue, and alpha. So alpha is just another term for transparency. And each of the comp component values is an integer from 0 to 255. So RGBA values are assigned to like individual pixels. So usually you can see like uh, this. Yeah, this is like some examples of RGBA. So this blue here is uh, this amount of red, this amount of green, this amount of blue, and then the transparency. Yeah. So if the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the pixel is opaque, the transparency will just be uh, one. Yeah. So uh, in, in Python, usually you manipulate images using this library called uh, uh, the Python image library or PIL. So, um, so there's a bit of history behind this. Uh, so usually uh, in, the, in the past, it was called PIL. But uh, after that, the work on it has been discontinued and it was picked up again in a separate fork called Pilo. So you, when you install it, you have to install it, uh, install it by the name Pilo. But for, for reasons of maybe like say backwards compatibility, when you import it, you import it as PIL. Yeah, so this is like just to, for any con to solve any confusion. Yeah, so you can install it using this command like conda install Pilo. Okay, it's, it's already in included. If you have Anaconda, it's already included there. If you somehow like uninstall it or you created a new environment or you're using pip, you can just like pip install pillow. Yeah. Uh, okay, so in, in PIL, right, uh, image coordinates uh, are in this, this format. So each pixel has an XY coordinate. The origin is the top left corner. So, and then, and then the X coordinate increases as you move to the right. So this is like, from similar to the, the, the way you usually do in math, but the y coordinate increases as you go down. So it's like the opposite of the usual way you do in math. Yeah. Um, and also like there's this concept of the box tuple. So this in sometimes you want to crop an image, right? So this let's say this is a original image. You want to crop the black, like this area out from the image. So you need to provide the the the, the crop function a box tuple of left, top, right, bottom. So the left just means the leftmost x coordinate. Top means the uppermost y coordinate, and right means uh, the the rightmost x coordinate, and bottom is the the bottommost y coordinate. So here you can see uh, this three one nine six 
three means that this x coordinate here, one is this upper upper coordinate here, nine is this coordinate here, and six is the bottom coordinate here. Okay, so move to the notebook. Okay, we'll be doing it on uh, this here instead. So um, it's almost the same imports uh, as last time, but uh, now we import this from PIL, import this image image class. So um, okay, so in in your in your data right, there's uh, there's this uh, image called cat.jpg. So it's it's provided by this file. So how you open an image is basically you call a image dot open, and then you can you can pass in a string or you can pass in the path object. So in this case, we'll pass in the path object straight away. And in Jupyter Notebook, you can view the image, the open image straight away. You can just check, you can check check it, and it will just open in Jupyter Notebook. So you can also check the image size, the so the the the, the, the pixel dimensions. So it's it's provided in this format, the width followed by the height. Okay, so common things you can do with PIL. Um, so you can rotate images, you can crop images, you can resize images. So we just like um, show a quick demo of rotating the images. So um, let, let's say like we want to rotate these images like 10 degrees like uh, clockwise. So you in clockwise you put a negative in front. So you can rotate it and then you can check that. Yeah. So so the 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 the, the bounding box, the dimensions are still the same. Like as the previous, the, so it's still six four zero by nine six one, but it has been rotated. So you can see there's a bit of um, the, the black boxes here, but you can just later we'll be cropping it out to to, to make it. Um, yeah. So, it, it, so this is the box tuple that we came across just now. It is the left top right bottom. So you 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 call it, um, you call a crop function on it. So, and then you can see that it will crop it to a square. Okay, so so why why the actual square? Okay, so so this is because like uh most of the time like say say um if you're using a, a a computer vision model usually they expect images to be in the form of a square, so yeah this is just um yeah, a demo <laughs> for, for for changing image to a square. Okay, so um we call so so just now all the functions that we go right, it does not mutate the original image. So if you can see right now that we have the crop one, you can look at the original cat image. Is, is still unchanged. And the original image in the disk is also unchanged. So these are just like variables in the computer program right now. They are not saved to the disk. So we need to save it to the disk. So we create a we create this a new output directory the same way that we did just now using the os.make directories. And then we call the dot save method from the image. So we we, we pass in this path called a cat crop dot jpeg. And now that now now if you open the uh if you open the explorer you will find that the, the there's this new image there. Okay, so um oftentimes right you need to um resize images in bulk. So it can be for a couple of reasons. Say uh sometimes it's to save space. So um sometimes you like uh you want to move like say you have an image data set that you want to move to uh uh, another computer, or you want to move to a, a, a remote, uh, a, a cloud, a remote cloud instance, for trade. Let's say for training an image model. So maybe the original images, the sizes might be very big. So it might be like in hundreds of gigabytes, and it might take like forever for you to copy them over. So it might be a good idea to resize them if you don't need them to be like uh, say uh, the original size. So yeah, so in PIL does provide like a, a functionality to resize, and you can resize images like. It can be like uh, hundreds and thousands of images like very, very fast. Like if you resize them one by one, it will take forever. So yeah. So here's how we resize the images. So um, you first provide the path to the images. So um, in, in this in this in this uh, data set we have okay, let's just open that. You see that we have a few like car images here, and they are rather big. You can see like they are one thousand by seven hundred. So you, I guess most most uh computer vision uh, models they don't take in like such a huge size. Yeah. So uh for 
for saving space and other reasons, you, you, usually you should want to resize. Yeah, and also like because so the model can run faster. So, um, okay, so we have provided the, the, the path to this directory. And we, so in, I'll just explain what this, what this chunk of code does. Yeah, so the max, we run the, so let's say we run the maximum dimension, either the width or the height to be 200 pixels. So for each of the, the image path in, so we call it block returns a, a, a generator. So you can iterate through, you can iterate through a generator without, without turning it into a disk. So that's what we're doing now. So for each of the image paths in the generator, we open the image. And if, so we call the image dot size returns you a tuple of the width and height. So we use this built-in function called max. So max basically, it returns the largest value in a tuple in a list or something. So, so, in the, so if the largest value of width or height is exceeds, uh, two hundred. Oh yeah, so if, if um, yeah, if if if, if the largest uh, value, if the largest dimension of the image exceeds this max dimension here, which is two hundred, then we resize the image. So how we resize the image? Uh, you, let's say we want to keep we want to keep the aspect ratio of the image. So we we don't want to distort it to to squish it into like something weird. So we first we need to find a ratio to resize it. So it's just two hundred divided by the max of the, the dimension. And so the, we, we, can, we can pass in, so the original image size, we here we pass in to the two variables, width and height. And after that, we resize it. Uh, we, we, we multiply the original width and height by the ratio. And then we convert, because this might be a, 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 a float, so it might be a decimal. And we cannot resize an image to a decimal point. So then you convert it to an integer. So here we convert it into an integer. And the, we, we pass it as a single argument to the resize method. So it, it needs to be as a single argument. So it, it can pass it as a tuple or something. Yeah, so here we pass it as a tuple of the new width and the height. And then we save it as the uh, output directory and followed by the, the file name of the original image. So if you run this, it will take a slight while because image resizing is not the, the, the cheapest computer operation. Eh? So and then we go to the output directory. Now we have the images here. So if you check the dimensions, you can now see that they do not exceed 200. Yeah, so. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I think that should be all for my part for now. Uh, now I'll hand on over to Chris who will talk about um, web, web scraping. Uh, so, okay. um, for now, yeah, I think um, I think it will cover quite a lot of content. You guys probably need a while to digest it a bit. So just let's just take like a short, uh, four minutes, five minutes break. Then we, when we come back, we'll talk about web scraping. Uh, don't worry if you feel like you're a bit lost or you haven't really caught up to the content yet or you just joined, because uh, later that when I when it's my part, I'll be showing you guys the example using a collab notebook. So we, you can start over again. Okay, um, so for people who are still here, uh, you can you will see that there's like a collab notebook link over here. I will take you guys to go and visit the collab notebook. Okay, I just send the link in the chat. So just click on it and uh, you open up the collab notebook for this and just uh, click on file and save a copy in drive. Okay, there's a screenshot that tells you how to do this. And uh, yes, uh, Ming Yi, the the workbook is supposed to be run in collab. I plan for it to be run in collab. Yeah. 
if you want to run it locally, you can run it as well, but you probably need to install the library beautiful suit. But for the purposes of the workshop, it's just okay to just like follow through together with me uh, using the collab notebook. Let me just set up the collab notebook. Ambrose, your question is uh, why not use PyCharm, right? Okay, so there are many tools that we can use to write Python code. And I feel like each tool has its own purpose in writing like Python code. But uh, for purposes of learning, since all, a lot of us here are like beginners and we're all like new to like uh, this whole automation thing, right? I think it's easier for us to just uh, use a simpler tool like Google Colab or like Jupyter Notebook, where we can just immediate, immediately get feedback on our code. So yeah, if you would like to use PyCharm for your own projects, uh, feel free to go ahead. Uh, you can definitely do so. Okay, so um, I think most of us should be back from the break now. I will need you guys to open up the bit.ly link that I just said in the chat. So when you open up the link, it will lead you to the Google Collab Notebook that we'll be using today. But the moment when you open it, uh, you'll see this like this screenshot uh, on the top right, no, on the top left, sorry. Uh, you need to click on File and you click Save a Copy in Drive. Uh, okay, the, the red box is a bit wrongly positioned. It's supposed to be save a copy in Drive. So click on save a copy in Drive because that's important for your changes to be saved. Okay, I'll begin in like another minute. Okay, let me just repeat myself again. Uh, if you are just back from the break, uh, you will see on the slides, right? It tells you to go and visit the link, at the bit.ly link over there. I just pasted the link in the chat. Uh, you guys can just click on it and you'll reach a collab notebook. So you just need to go to the collab notebook, click on file and click save a copy in Drive. Okay, without further ado, let me begin, all right? So, what I'm going to showcase next um, is, in a sense, what it is web scripting, but uh, it's going to show a very specific example that I use personally. Okay, like I said previously just now, automation is really quite 
a personal thing. And um, I'm just going to showcase like how I use this uh, web scraping thing to sort of help me in my schoolwork. Because I think a lot of you guys here, you guys are like students as well. So perhaps some of you might benefit from what I said today. But if you guys don't agree with what I did, or like if you guys don't kind of relate to the example that I just, I just showed, I think it's good that we just like absorb the concepts that I'm going to teach you guys today. Because these concepts can be applied to like all other websites as well. Okay. So the story is, okay, when you want to come up with a good automation project, right, it, you must have a good backstory. And like this, this, what I did today is like really like what I faced when I was taking one of my modules in NUS. So in one of my modules in NUS, what happened was there's a group project that we needed to do for like half the semester. And in the group project, you know, you would expect like everyone to contribute equally, right? But no, in my group, there was this one guy who essentially didn't do any work. And of course, at the end of the group project, you are supposed to do a peer review, right? Like you need to like tell your prof, or oh, uh, all my teammates did work equally, or like some guy didn't do work equally or whatsoever. And what so happened was, uh, I really felt like the last guy didn't deserve his grade. And then when I was filling out the peer review form, there was a question that said, uh, if there was any member whom you rated like lower than user, user, could you provide more details? So I thought, what's the best way for me to prove to the prof that the guy didn't really do as much work, work as the rest of us and doesn't deserve the, the grades that we do? Or like uh, we deserve more grades like because we did more of the work in the group project. So I thought really long and hard about how I can prove to the prof that that was the case. Okay, so what I did, okay, because you know when you have like a project, you start a group chat, right? I actually use Python to just help me count how many messages are sent by each student. And I just use, after using Python, I just send the whole Jupyter notebook to the prof so that the prof can see for himself how many messages every single member sent in the group. And you guys can do that for on your own as well. Okay, let me just show you what I sent to my prof. Okay, so I exported the Telegram groups group chat and then I basically use the web scraping tools to extract the sender names, okay? So there was 1,414 messages. And then I counted how many messages each person sent. And then I just plot, plotted a bar graph and I just sent it to the prof, okay? So this was me. This, I sent like 300 messages in the group chat. But then the guy that was an absolute slacker sent like 100 messages. Okay, I'm not going to release this notebook for you, but this was the actual thing I sent to the prof. Of course, I covered up the names. So this is a very personal example that I used that really did, where, I, where, where using Python really did help me do something that I wasn't able to do. Because I really couldn't just like count 1,440 messages on my own. Without Python, I just had to like browse through every single messages. Okay, and I'm going to show you guys how to do that today as well. But of course, we're not going to do that on some random group chat. Okay, over here, what you see is, uh, okay, this is a bit small. Let me just resize this. Okay, over here, you see a Windows machine over here. And over here, you see the NUS hackers group chat. So I, I'm sure a lot of you guys are like part of it. And this is the NUS hackers group chat. So actually, what I'm going to do is, I'm going I'm to show you like a, what? Okay, it's too small. Let me just uh, make it bigger. Okay, it is still too small, but I hope you guys can just like, like, uh, is there a way for me to change the resolution? Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna, okay. Uh, hang on, uh, display settings. Uh, let me lower the resolution a bit. Okay, it's, it's sort of got worse. Uh, okay, actually, let me just scale it. No, it's not about the size of the Telegram window. It's that the text is too small. Okay, it's slightly bigger now. Uh, okay, uh, slightly bigger now. You guys should be able to see now. Okay, so over here, this is the Telegram app that all of us are, are used to, right? And this is the NUS hackers chat that all of us uh, are in, like most of us are in. So 
this functionality is only available on the Telegram Windows client. So if you use a Mac Telegram or like use a Linux Telegram, you so you have to add, you have to find your Windows friend to ask them to do it for you. But you can do it on any group chat that you are in. Okay, so just click on the three dots. You just click export chat history. Okay, this button is only available on Windows. So get your Windows friend to do it for you. And then you can choose what to export. Okay, you can choose like all your messages. You can set a file limit. Then you can choose from oldest message to the present message. Then you click on export. Okay, then it will tell you it's exporting your chat data. Okay, so when that happens, you just click on show my data and you'll see like this folder called chat export. Okay, in this chat export file, you can, okay, I can, okay, so I have already ex extracted the chat and uh, I already downloaded it for you guys. So later we can just immediately go straight to downloading it. So let me just uh, close my Windows thingy. Okay, so um, after you extract the files, what you will see is, uh, Okay, you will see, okay, so this is like the chat export folder that we saw earlier, okay, chat export. And then uh, if you just open, you see a lot of HTML files here. So like for those of you who are unfamiliar with HTML files, they are essentially just like web pages, okay? You can just double click them and you open up in your browser, okay? So look at this browser file that I have here. It's really just the NUS hackers chat from the beginning of time, okay? Every single message is being extracted into this file over here okay and today what we are gonna do is we're gonna just extract out the names of the people who send this message okay extract the names of the people who send this message okay so moving on let me just do a notebook demo okay so all of you guys should have just okay if you guys missed this part just visit the bit.d link okay you need to click on file and you click save a copy in drive okay this is very important because if you don't save a copy in Drive, your changes that you, that you write here, it won't persist. You need to save the notebook into your own Drive so that you can save your, your changes in the, to the notebook will, will be saved. In, yeah. Okay, so right now over here, if you click on the Files tab, okay, it will, it will connect to, because this is Google Collaboratory, right? This tool, it doesn't run, okay, your Python code won't run on your own computer. It's essentially running on Google servers. So Google actually needs to allocate you like part of their server so that you can use it to run your code. Okay, so now that I, my instance is allocated, look at the top right, okay, you see the RAM and the disk. So my collab code is running on Google server now and you can see that there's no files in it at the moment. It's just one folder called sample data, which comes by default. Okay, so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Python to help us count who send the most messages messages in the NUS hackers public chat group? Okay, uh, I know you guys are probably might be a bit concerned about like you know people's messages being there and like data and all, but I'm using this example because it's a public group, and as I told you just now, anyone can just join the group and anyone can export the chat history. So in a sense, I feel that the data is safe for us to just run this notebook on today. But if you guys have any like feel anything uncomfortable about me using like that type of messages, maybe just write me an email afterwards, okay? So first thing that we need to do is we need to run this com command, okay? This command will essentially download the files that you saw earlier, okay? If I were to just refresh, okay? Over here, there's this refresh button here. You see that there's a hacker school folder now. And in the hacker school folder, underneath web scraping, you have the whole chat export folder that I showed you just now. Okay, they are exported using my Windows machine. Okay, and over here, there's all the messages.html that we opened up earlier as well. Okay, so right now, the next step that we need to do is we want to like load all these nine messages file because, because the NUS hackers chat, we have like 8,000 messages. So as a result, there's like nine files and we need to load all of them. So remember Itao said earlier, okay, we can actually use a file library called Glock. This glob thing sort of just helps you to, um, to just uh, get all the files with a uh, similar names. Okay. Uh, don't worry, uh, you don't you don't need to like go and to your notebook and just click on the play button right now. I will give you time to do so. So just look at my screen now and just follow along. Okay. So you just need to import the glob library and it's a built-in Python library. 
okay? And it, I can just run the glob function on star.html, okay? In the hacker school folder, web scraping, chat export, and then star.html, and it will select all the HTML files over here. So if I were to run this, you'll see that all my HTML files are selected because I use globbing to select all of them. And if you want to see how many files I have selected with Python, I can just run the length function. And it will tell me that I have nine files. Okay, so right now we are dealing with data. So when we deal with data, the first thing we need to do, we need to look at how the shape of our data looks like and how, uh, what's the data that we're dealing with. Okay, so I'm gonna just use this with open and I'm just gonna open one of the files. I'm just gonna open messages.html and see how it looks like, okay? And I've, I've just printed the first 20 lines so that you, know, you guys don't get too confused with the code output. And you can look at this and you see like there's, hit, there's this like weird code like thingy. And uh, for a lot of you guys, you pro are probably not too familiar with what this code like thing is. But okay, this code like thing is called HTML. And this HTML thing is what we call hypertext markup language. And it's not a programming language. Okay, it's not a programming language. It's just a markup language that decides, uh, in what error do you get? You can just paste in the chat. I'll look at it later. Um, yeah. You, the markup language just decides how your website looks and it, it decides the structure and the content of the website. Mm. Interesting error. Uh, it's Yen, can you help with that? Okay, uh, never mind. Moving on. Uh, wait, are you using? Okay, sorry. Uh, Mingyi, can you use Google Collab instead? If you use Google Collab, you won't face this problem. That's why I use Google Collab because I know that the whole process of like installing Jupyter Notebook and all, we might have some differences in our system. Okay, so for all of us to be on the same track, let's just use Google Collab. Okay, um, nothing happens after I click on from Glob, import Glob. Yeah, um, okay, so for things like uh, from Glob, import Glob, right, you can see if I run it, it's correct because uh, it won't show anything because it just, it's just trying to import the library into it. As long as the cell runs, it's correct. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna do a short demo on HTML now so that we can sort of just have a very quick crash course on what um, HTML is about. Okay, what you see here, over here on the right hand side. Okay, don't be too confused by all the different buttons in this. What you need to be concerned about is the website over here and like the HTML, HTML file over on the left hand side. Okay, so look at this. I can just add a, I can just type new stuff. I can be just be like, hello, I am in the middle of a class. Okay, there's a typo, but in the moment if I, I just save it, okay, you can see it appears in my website. But now if I were to give it a HTML tag, Okay, suppose I give it like heading two, okay? And I wrap it with like a closing heading two tag. Okay, and I save it. And then you see suddenly this paragraph, it becomes a header. So as you can see the, the text, each of them, it really does give the website structure. And in, and in many cases, I can also like use this HTML text to style content. Okay, so let me just give you an example. Over here, I have one paragraph and I have this paragraph as well, okay? I'm just gonna add a class equals to text width, okay? So classes are things in HTML that we can assign to text so that we can get them to take up a certain style, okay? Over here, I have class equals to text width as well. Okay, now if I were to save it, nothing happens. Because I still haven't defined the style yet, but wait, apparently it is, oh no. Okay, I, I put text rate, but over here I put red text. So if I change this to text rate, tada, suddenly you see the website on the right. These two paragraphs are styled as red color text. But look at this over here. This is still black. And why is that the case? Because I've added class equals text rate to these two paragraphs 
but the last paragraph here is still a normal paragraph. Okay, and this is very new to you guys, and I know it's very hard to wrap your head around, but don't worry because that's all we need to know to be able to understand today's workshop. Okay, if you want to learn more about HTML and CSS, you can just attend the hacker school on week six on 19 September, and our very capable HTML CSS master Jing Yan, who's also joining us today, will be will be teaching the workshop. Okay, but nevertheless, today what I've gone through about HTML CSS is enough for us to go through the content. Okay, so let me just go back to my notebook to do a demo. Uh, sorry, wrong notebook. Okay, so now that we sort of know what this code syntax is about, okay, uh, what you need to know is that literally every single website you go, right. How it looks like it's it's really like okay, let me just go to google.com. It's actually just HTML and CSS in disguise. Okay, if I right click and I click on view page source, okay. Um this looks a bit intimidating, but as you can tell, it's also like HTML. Okay, so literally every single website that we visit is the, the structure and the content is based on HTML, and HTML is gonna be how we are going to use Python to like extract the information that we need. Okay, so back to the notebook. For us to like uh, manipulate HTML, we need to use this very good Python library that's called Beautiful Soup. Okay, Beautiful Soup is, the, is like a Python library, a third party library that helps us to pass HTML files. Okay. And as you can tell, there's, there's a lot of things that we need to do here. There's like nine messages files, but we're not going to do all of that at one shot. We're just going to isolate the problem, make it a smaller problem first. And we're just going to like try passing one HTML file first. Okay. So to do that, uh, the syntax might be a bit confusing, but you can just follow along. You can just take my word that is the right syntax. Okay. You just need to create a variable. You can name the variable whatever you want, but you just need to load it with beautiful soup. And then, you need to use open. Open is what thing you know, it's what uh Ital taught you guys earlier about writing files and reading files. Just open and open the HTML file that we downloaded into this directory over here. Okay, and when you run it, oh okay. We, uh, I didn't run the previous line. So we want to run the previous line first. Okay, because we need to import the third party library called Beautiful Soup. And then we just run it. And now it doesn't complain. It, 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 it's not supposed to give you any output. Okay. And let's, let's, let's just start with something simple. Okay. Uh, let me just go back to my. Okay. Where did I open that file? Um, hang on. Huh? Okay, so over here, this is the message file that I, taught, I, I told you guys about earlier. And essentially our task here is really just to extract the names. Okay, Francis Lee, NUS Hackers, Christopher Go. We just want the names. So if you want the names, really what we need to do is you just need to go to any web browser, your, your Mozilla Firefox, your Google Chrome, and just right click on the name and click on inspect element. Okay, and then you'll see this browser thing okay that is that looks very intimidating for you i'm gonna i'm just gonna make it bigger for you guys it's, it's gonna have a lot of buttons and it's a lot gonna be very confusing for you guys but if i mouse over like i right click i inspect element okay you'll see that my name is highlighted christopher go okay and look at what we see over here we see class equals to from underscore name okay let me just click on somebody else's name uh, let's do Raynaud. Okay, Raynaud, right click, inspect element. And you can see class from, class equals to from underscore name over here. Okay, so what this tells us is in this whole HTML document, all the names, they all have a class that's called from name. And that, that's how we can use it to select all the names that's in this file. Okay, going back to the, no, going back to the notebook. Okay, I'm just gonna run soup dot select, and I'm just gonna select the class that's called from name. Okay, and I'm just gonna show you the first ten results. 
And what we see here is we're going to see like all these elements. It's a div element and it's a class from name. And we see like 10 of them here. And what we see here are all names. Okay. Let me just give you guys like 10 seconds to digest the information so far. Okay. So what you need to know is that the information that we just showed here, um, it is inside a HTML tag that's called div. And all the names are labeled with a class that's called from name. And that's how we can extract them. And after selecting from name, I, can, I actually have the information for all the names in the chat already. But it's still a little messy because we don't want this. We don't want the div. We only just want the name. Okay, so there's this. Okay, let me just uh, demonstrate this. Okay, I'm just going to add like a new code. So after I select this, right, what I can see from this, I just, I just check the file, the data type of this output. It's actually a list. So for a list, we can actually just access it by its index. So let me look at the first, or actually look, let me look at the second item. Okay, the second item, okay, it, okay, this is the third item. Actually, let me go faster. I, I think I'm going a bit too slow. Okay, the third item here is Christopher Go, and I want to extract just the text. So I can actually do something called dot contents. And dot contents will just give me a list of the contents in it. And as you can see, this is still a list again. So I need to get the first item. And then now I get the string of my name, but it's, there's still a bit extra information to the left and right. So I need to run a dot strip. And finally, I have my name. Okay, now I need to do the exact same step to every single name that we have in the document. Okay, so I just run this list comprehension over here. It, it essentially just extract out every single div, and we're just going to get the name of each of them and just run it. Okay. And now you can see, I have just extracted from the HTML file every single name that we see on the HTML file. Okay, if you are not convinced, let's run through this together. Francis Lee and US hackers Christopher Go. If I were to go back here, all the way at the top, Francis Lee and US hackers Christopher Go. And that's very simple. We have already extracted all the names that's in the HTML file. Okay. So right now, I have a challenge for you guys. This is the time that you can get, you can also go back to the Collab Notebook and run the code all the way until here. Okay, and so the challenge is a lot of these names, if you look at this, a lot of these names are repeated. Let's see YCX, YCX, YCX. They are repeated. How do I get a list of unique names in the chat? And the second challenge is, how do you count how many unique names are there? Okay, and I'll give you five minutes. No, actually four minutes. I think four minutes is better. I'll give you guys four minutes to just try out the thing and just uh, try out the two, two challenges and just uh, run the notebook until this stage. Okay, and the time starts now. If you guys have any questions, please just ask in the chat at the moment. Okay, if you guys have finished attempting the challenge, right, just put a yes in the participants panel so that I can have a gauge of like how completed you are with the challenge.
if any of you guys are facing any problems, uh, like running the previous cells or like opening the notebook, please just like voice out in the chat as well. Ming Yi, yes, I think your answer might be correct. Okay, so I think I was, uh, you, you guys can just look back at the shared screen and uh, I will just go through the answer to this. Okay, so over here, let's just look at this again. We have a lot of duplicated names and they're all in a list at the moment. So for us to just extract a list Okay, not really on this. We just if what if we want a set of unique names, we can actually just use the Python function set. Okay, because in a set, every element inside has to be unique. Okay, that's like the mathematical definition of a set and Python's definition of a set as well. So inside a set, we can just pass uh, what's the variable called? Let me check. Raw names. Okay, the variable is called raw names, and we can just pass this into a set and if I were to run it I now will only get unique names okay so now it makes it very easy for us to just count how many people have chatted in this group okay I can just run length of set of raw names so that gets the length of like the set we saw earlier and the answer is we have 57 people okay so I hope you guys can see the simplicity of it. Within just a few minutes, just a few lines of code, we are able to just process the HTML file and extract how many names, how many people have spoken in a group. Okay, we have we have already like counted how many people have spoken in the chat group. Okay. Next up, we want to count how many messages each user has has sent. Okay, let's look at raw names again. Okay, raw names. It sort of just gives us the names that the Python, like Python has seen, right? It's just like Francis, NUS Hackers, Christopher, Go, and blah, blah, blah. Can we just count it and will we just get the right number of messages? Okay. And let me just, let me just do, do a, like, let me just, just, okay. Let me just run this snippet of code. Okay. Uh, essentially what I, okay. Hang on. Okay. Let me, let me just uh, backtrack a bit. Okay, so if you look at this, right, do you think we can just count like Francis, NS Hackers, and Christopher Go and just count the number of times we see the name and just use that as like a counter to see how many messages each person has sent? And the answer is if you were to just look at your data more closely, you actually cannot. Because look over here, over here you have one message, you have two messages. But you but the name YCX only appears once. Okay. Uh, let me just scroll down a bit more. Okay, look at this again. There's like one message here, there's like two messages here. But my name only appears once. There's like one message here, there's like one message here, but my name only appears once as well. So we need a, a different strategy. Okay. So if we were to just count the names, okay. Python will tell you that Chris only sent two messages. But that's in fact not very accurate because Chris actually sent four messages. Okay, so this tells us that we need to change our counting strategy. And we need to observe the structure of the messages that we see in the HTML file. Okay, again, just open the HTML file and just look at it and just stare closely at it. You'll find that every single message, the things that are like very that are common amongst them is that they have things like a timestamp. Then you sort of realize that each of them, they are actually just messages. This is a message, this is a message, and this is a message, this is a message. The only difference is that whether the messages have a name or not. Okay. And what we're trying to do here is that we need to come up with a new strategy to count the messages. So previously we just selected all the names and we know that it doesn't work already. But our new strategy right now is we want to select all messages instead of just selecting all names. We select all messages. If the message has a name, then it's great. We don't need to touch it because it has a name. But if the message doesn't have a name, then we need to tag it to the last seen name, last last 
scene name. Okay, so look over here. This message doesn't have a name. If I if I want to make it such that if my program sees that a message doesn't have a name, I will tag it with Christopher Go. If this message doesn't have a name, I'll tag it with Christopher Go. That's how I want to change my algorithm. Okay, so back to the notebook. Uh, wrong notebook. Okay. Uh, in fact, let me just go back to to the to this NUS hackers chat. So, like I said, the first thing we need to do is we want to be able to select all the messages. Okay, and we need to stare very closely at the structure of this whole notebook again. Okay, you need to realize that if I just right-click on a message and I click on inspect element, I can actually just like move up until my whole message is like highlighted. Okay. Okay, if you look at the HTML at the bottom, you can see like there's different divs where the class has a has a name of message. You see, class equals message, class equals message, class equals message. Okay, and if I were to just mouse over them, it, okay, it will select the first message, second message, and third message. And that's where you know we sort of got the right thing already. And to make our code even more robust, we need to actually like look at a case where it's actually like multiple messages, but one name, okay? Inspect element. Over here, you will see that this, okay, no, actually this is one, one joint message. Let me just go down more. Okay, back to this, back to this example over here. In this case, we have this message and this message. They are both under, they are both sent by Chris and they are both two different message. And we, we can look at the class name. And the, the class name, okay, the class name, right? You can see that the, the classes is message default and message default. Okay, it's just that the second message, it doesn't have a name and he has an extra class that's called join. Okay, so right now we know that if you want to select all the messages in the chat, we can just, uh, we can just select from this class name called message and called default. But we cannot just, Okay, so your next question will be, why not just select by message, right? Okay, and if you need to look at the, look closely at the messages again, you realize that there are certain messages. Okay, look at this message. Okay, this is the message, the first ever message. And it has a class that's called message and service. Okay, and these are messages that are like, it's put in by Telegram and it's not sent by human beings. So we sort of need to differentiate the messages that are sent by Telegram and the messages that are sent by human being, beings. And we can see that messages that are sent by Telegram is message service, and messages that are sent by human beings are message default. Okay? So over here, uh, okay, actually, I think in the chat, people are asking about how to download the files, right? So actually, you can just uh, visit this link. This is the link where I just, uh, where I, Oh shit, uh, sorry. Uh, where, where I uploaded all the files for the for this section. And you can just go here and click on download zip. Then you will download all the files and you can actually open up the HTML files in your own browser. Okay. Okay, back to this. Uh, back to this. So again, we need to select all the human sent messages with a message default. Okay, and, we, and this, that's what this code does. And when I run this, you'll see that HTML for the messages that are sent by human beings. It's sent by Francis, sent by, yeah, it's a bit confusing now, but we need to clean up the data a bit. So uh, how does, okay, it's a bit difficult to clean up the data when you see all of them at once. So just look at how one of them look like. Okay, you see that there's like uh, my name, and we and the message over here. And right now what we want to extract is we want to like select the sender name. So from this just one message over here, we can actually just one message dot select from name. And same as before, we get the, the HTML that tells you like what's the name of the person who sent this message. Okay. And we can just run this. There's the same sequence of code that we ran before and it will extract the name over here. Okay, so right now we have all the messages ready. Let's just print out every message sender. Okay, again, this code prints out the name of the sender. And since we have all messages, we can just put it in a loop. 
and I'm just going to run this. And you realize that you run halfway and it will error out. Okay, and this is expected because I just want to go through with you guys how to debug code like that when you like face this type of problems. So it tells you that list index is out of range. Okay, so we need to look at our code here and we need to see very closely uh, at which parts we are like doing list operations. So over here you can see like there's a you are choosing the first item, you are choosing the first item. So to sort of like figure out what's wrong, right? Shall we, we can just remove the list operations altogether. And I'm just going to print message.select from name. I'm just going to run this. And what you're going to see here is you're going to see all the names of the senders until we reach the part that it gets stuck. Okay. So this is the part we got stuck just now. And then this is where like Python complained and said, says that the code doesn't work. And it complained that the code doesn't work because this is a list without any items. Okay. And that's when we need to do something to fix it. We need to check whether when we extract the sender, if there is actually a sender in the first place. Because if there is no sender, uh, if, when we try to like get the zeroth item, right, Python will give you an error. Because the list has nothing, you try to get the zeroth item, or, or rather the first item in, in human terms, it, it can't give you anything, so you throw an error. So we need to do a check to see whether there is a sender. If the message has no sender, we just print something different. We just say uh, someone send this. There's some, someone send this. And if it has a sender, we just print the sender's name. Okay, let me just run this. And look at this. Okay, we have a lot of someone send this now. And we have a lot of someone send this. Okay, that is how you know we are getting somewhere. Because when you see a someone send this here, you know that all these messages are actually attributed to this. When I look at someone send this here, you know that this messages is actually attributed to this. And that's exactly our next challenge. Our next challenge is to change all the someone send this to the last scene name. Okay, and how do we do this? Okay, so for this challenge right now, I've already, I've already copied the exact same code that you see above. And you just need to edit this code snippet to make it uh, such that when you, whenever we print someone send this, right, instead of printing someone send this, we'll print the last scene name. So for example, right now it's Christopher Go and someone send this. It should be Christopher Go and Christopher Go. Okay, so let's have another five minutes for you guys to catch up to this part of the notebook and just try out the challenge. And when you guys are done, just click yes.
It is like a slightly harder challenge so far, like only three people have done it so far. Okay, nine people have done it so far. When we hit 10, I will just uh, show you guys the answer. Okay, we have 10 people so far. Okay, I think that I think there's like some people who are a bit, who are like having questions about how to open up the chat log in your browser. So let me just quickly demonstrate it. So again, you can, this is where I uploaded all the materials. You can just click on download zip. Okay, so you will see this zip file, okay. If you open up with your whatever file, files you use to like unzip files, right? Uh, okay. Hang on. Uh, I'm still looking for it. Okay. So this is the folder. It's unzipped already. You can just go to the web scraping folder. Then over here, you see the chat export. It's exactly the same as, uh, exactly the same as when I just ex exported it from Telegram. Okay. I didn't do anything to it special. I didn't do anything special to it. So you see all the HTML files here. You can just double click on this. And you open up in your browser with all the chat log nicely formatted. Okay. So yeah, that's how you like just download it. Just, that's how you open up the chat log. Okay, back to the notebook. So how do we solve this? Change the someone send this to the last scene, last scene name. So over here, you know that this part is when we can sort of keep track of the last scene sender, right? So we, we need to like assign it to a variable. So last scene sender equals to this. You can name the, the variable whatever you, way you want, but I can, I'm just leaving it last scene sender. Then uh, to like, I'm, I'm just gonna print the last scene sender. Okay. And um, over here, it, you want to change the someone send this to a last scene sender, right? So I'm just gonna print last, Scene sender over here. Okay, and uh, I just want to initialize the variable at the top to ensure that I'm not like uh, I'm not like uh, getting any weird values and all. I, I don't think this is necessary. I think this will work without. But I, most of the time when I write code, I just like, like to initialize my variable so that it's safer. Okay, so look over here. We fixed the problem. Okay, we, we no longer have any like uh what someone sent this. Instead, all the someone sent this is uh being is is printing out the last scene sender instead. So really like this type of like techniques, right? It's really just a combination of all the of the basic programming that we learn and like just like some creative thinking and we can come up with all this. And we are really almost done really. Like look at this. This is like Essentially, if we count this, right? Okay, I scrolled up a bit too much. Essentially, if we just count this, we can get the number of messages each person has sent. Okay, so moving on, I'm gonna just like uh, convert the names into a proper list of names. So I'm gonna use a list over here called all names because I'm like, putting it in the list data structure sort of helps me to, uh, to just process the data better. Okay. So essentially it's the same thing. I create a list and then I append it to the list. I append the last scene sender. And then whenever I see a sender, right, I just set the last scene sender to the name. Okay, and I just run this. And I have a Python list. Okay, this is no longer just printing out the output. I have a Python list of all the names. Okay, and the next step is really to just count it. Okay, how do we count, right? Now we have a proper list of names. So of course, there's many ways to do it. You can just write a Python program to do it. But today, the theme is really just to use third-party libraries to help us make life easier, right? So I'm just gonna quickly introduce to you guys this library called Pandas. 
Okay, Pandas is a very popular data wrangling library. It can, it can help really like make it easy for us to just deal with data and like count items and stuff. Okay, so I'm just gonna run this, import Pandas as PD. It's just a convention to like import Pandas as PD. And Pandas has a thing called a data frame. So it's essentially it's like a tabular data format that where you can just fit in your data. Okay, and you can, you can sort of interact with it. You see, I just created a data frame uh, I just fit in the data all names and I just printed the data frame out. And then this data frame is just like a tabular format. It even tells you like how many rows, how many columns there are. Okay, so this tells you that in this message file, we have 991 messages and uh, 991 messages and what and who sent each of those messages. Okay, so I'm just going to select this column, this zero column. So it's DF0. And I'm just going to write this function called value counts. And very easily, like super easily. Okay, just this few lines of code. We just made Python count how many, like how many occurrences of each name there are already. You see, so YCX sent 240 messages. And uh, YCX is actually here with us today, I believe. So yeah, hi Stanford. And the second one is like Huawei. And the third one is like Shara and all. So yeah, very easily, we just run one function. It tells, it counts for you how many messages are sent by each person. Okay, then now we're gonna do something that is quite interesting. We're gonna just use the value counts and we just add a dot plot. Okay, and you are just probably like a bit lost, right? Because like, this is like a third party library and you don't know like how to find these functions, but this is like a built-in function of the pandas library. Okay, building functions of the pandas library that makes it super easy for us to just process data. When you have just have a, when you have a table of data, you can just put a dot plot. And I just run this. And look at this. So easily I can have a bar chart showing me how many people send. It's a it's a like a graphical representation of like how many messages is sent by uh, each person. Uh, about challenge free solution, don't worry about it. I will just share the answers later and you can sort of just refer to it. Okay, so look at this. We have this uh, very nice chart that you can just show your boss. Because you know like when you do data stuff, your boss always like to see things in like graphical formats and all. So very easily, just add a dot plot, you get this bar chart done. So the next question is, are we done yet? And of course it's not so simple. We only just did it on one out of nine files. Now we have to do it on everything again. And are we gonna just repeat this whole workshop like, like the, from from the start of my segment until now like nine times? Of course not, because this is Python. Python makes it very easy for us to repeat the same things nine times. Okay, remember earlier I did a file blobbing thing, and we have these exported message files, right? At the start of the notebook, I did an exported message files and I selected all the files. Since I was able to do the processing on one file, I can very easily just use a for loop and do it for all nine files again. So look at this, okay? Uh, it's, the same, it's the same code as we read earlier. It's just that we have a, a, another for loop for each message file in exported message file. And then we just like run everything that we've run so far. Okay, it's everything here is the same as what we did earlier, except that we just like open the message file. See, message file, message file, exported message files, okay? Using this for loop, we just run this. And within just a few seconds, it tells you that we have 8,103 names. Okay, and that's exactly the amount of messages we have, right? Since the NUS hackers chat has been created, 8,103 messages. And each of these messages are tagged to 8,103 names. Okay, so right now, right, you are probably like asking, uh, hang on. Interesting. Uh, there was one cell that was gone. Let me just edit, edit this back again. Um, how would you know that your data is correct, right? That after you're running this code, how would you know that your code works, that the number of names you extracted is correct? So how I would do this is I just need to check the length of all my names. Length of all my names. Again, it's A103, right? I just need to check whether it's the same as the length of all my messages. Okay, something is wrong. 
uh, hang on. Um, okay, I saw, I think I, I, I missed something out here. So this isn't really working. Uh, okay, let me just add a message counter. And then I just, I'm just going to add like message counter. I just add the length of all messages. Okay, because it's all messages here, it's talking about the, all the messages in one file. Whereas this all names is talking about all the names across everything. Okay, so I need to add a counter to sort of count the number of messages across all my files. Okay, so every single time I process all messages, I add the, the, the length of it to message counter. Okay, so I'm just going to run this again. Then right now message counter will give me the right number of, of messages. Message counter. Okay, this is unexpected. Let me see what's the difference. Message counter. Okay, I probably made some mistake in my code somewhere. Should we add the counter outside the loop? Uh, oh, yes. You are absolutely correct. See, guys, even though I'm a good program, okay, I'm, I, even though I'm an experienced programmer, I still make mistakes sometimes. Okay, this is embarrassing, but remember guys, as developers, it's okay for us to make mistakes. And as long as we just stay calm and debug the mistakes, it's fine. All right. So right now, if I were to run message counter, you won't have such an obscenely high number anymore because I just placed the, the code in the, in the wrong loop part of the loop. Okay, and then if I just run this check again, and it's true, okay? This means that we ran our code correctly and uh, all the names we have recorded is correct, okay? So right now we just need to do the same thing again. Just do a value counts. Then you'll find that the people who send the most messages on the group is how we with 970 message and YCX with like 911. And we plot the bar graph again. And we are done, okay? This demonstration is done and we we've, we've did it. Okay, so the next thing is like, you can, after doing this exercise, you can sort of see if you can spot your name there. And if you don't spot your name there, really just join us at our Telegram chat. Okay, t.me slash NAS hackers chat. Okay, we can just like discuss about cool things or you can just go there and laugh at me about my live demonstration failure today. Yeah, and it, yeah, really like if you reach here, right, great job on complete, completing this. There's really a lot of other cool stuff that you can do with this. You can do things like generate a word cloud of all the messages. Okay, or you can just have a chart of the group chat activity to see like whether is it at like night time more people talk or like in the morning more people talk, that type of thing. And can you like fit all the messages that is discussed into like a machine learning model and just make the machine learning model like speak like an NUS hacker. Okay, so there's really a lot of things that we can do with Python. And really today what we demonstrated today is really just using third party libraries to help you do your job. Okay, okay, and right. In case you guys didn't really realize what we've done here, right? We've actually did quite a thorough treatment of like solving computational problems. Okay, remember at the start, we've only just processed one file. Okay, it's the same thing as like when we write programs, we break down a very big problem into a very small problem first. And then we break down the small problem into even smaller problems, such as like trying out extracting the names first. Okay. It's only when we solve the smaller problems that we join together the, all the solutions to solve the bigger problem and then to solve the biggest problem again. And that's what we do, did today. It's really about like back to your programming basics and just uh, knowing the right tools to use. Okay, so this is just the first demonstration, first demonstration today about Python automation with web scripting. So in fact, right, this type of tools with beautiful soup, you can do it with like all, a lot of like other websites. Okay, suppose we go to IMDB. Okay, IMDB, you want to like extract names of like, okay, let me just go to one of the top charts. Uh, most popular shows. Okay, and you want to extract like the names of all the most popular TV shows. Just again, inspect element. Okay, and you can see like over here, there's a title column. Oh my gosh. Uh, 
somehow it's not working well. Okay, over here you see, you see the Umbrella Academy is highlighted and then it's, uh, it's inside this class that's called title column. So you can sort of just use Beautiful Soup, select the class title column and again you can get all the Okay, all the titles of names or like IMDB and whatsoever. Okay, so really today here, the example might not be applicable to you, but it's really just about the concepts and the skills that we've learned. Okay, uh, back to this. So the next demonstration I'm going to show you guys, okay, it's not going to be as long as this one. The next demonstration is really very short. Okay, it's about downloading YouTube videos. But the first thing before I start on this demonstration is really, everything we're showing here is just a technical demo. We really don't condone any like, copyright misuse or like infringement. Okay, so there's a new notebook that we need to visit again. Okay, uh, let me just uh, copy the link and I will send in the chat over here. Okay, so let's just uh, go visit this notebook, bit.ly slash uh, hacker school python youtube. Okay, uh, and I'll just do a very quick demonstration. This is really a very quick demo. It's not gonna be like, it's not gonna be like a code through as we did just now. So over here, right, the problem statement is right, suppose your dad like sends you a bunch of like YouTube links that he found while browsing YouTube. Okay. Sends you a bunch of links he, he found while browsing YouTube and he wants you to download the YouTube videos into a MP3 song format. And then you, of course, being a very like law abiding citizen, you just tell him, no, that's illegal. And uh, of course, I can't, I can't like uh, confirm or deny whether this situation actually happened. But the thing is, we can actually do something about this because as a curious hacker, you want to explore the possibility of doing so with your newfound Python skills, right? So over here, again, this is the same command. I'm just gonna run this. And what happens is it takes a while because Google is still trying to allocate you a machine. And then once it allocates you a machine, you just need to refresh and over here, you see youtube.txt, okay, youtube.txt. Okay, I can just open it up and collect. And you will see that over here, you have a bunch of like YouTube links. Okay, so these are uh, a bunch of YouTube links that are selected just for the purpose of today's workshop. We can just sort of use it as an example. Okay, and right now I can just use Python to sort of just print out what the file looks like. Okay, just file.read, and then you get all the links. And right now we just want to convert it to just uh, convert it into a list, okay? Pre-process it into a list of links. And that's actually very easy. Just YouTube links equals to file read lines and you get a list of links, okay? Then right now, the next thing you do, of course, as like a person who like hasn't read not too well versed with this, you just ask, just ask Google, right? How to use Python to download YouTube videos, okay? And then they'll tell you a list of things over here. And of course they'll tell you, and then they'll tell you that one of the libraries that you can use is like YouTube DL. Okay, then you try to import it and it will tell you that the module is not found. And that's because remember when we use third party libraries, we need to install it first. Okay, and you can just run this command here to install it. pip install YouTube DL. Even running it on Colab, right? It installs the library on Colab, on your Colab instance itself. So right now I installed YouTube DL on Colab. And then when I import it, it's successful. Okay, I press the play button, nothing shows up because it's successful. Okay, so YouTube DL is the third party Python library that helps us download YouTube video, right? So uh, let me just uh, look at the YouTube DL documentation. So that's how I first get started, right? It's a command line program, program I just visit the, as a developer, I will just go to the library and I'll go and look at the Python, like how, how I can use it to like, use it in code, okay? So over here, look at this, developer instructions and embedding YouTube download. So I can sort of look at the, the readme and I can just click on it. And then it tells you that to download a YouTube video, you can just use this code, okay? And, you, and as good developers, right? Okay, all good developers just copy paste code. So of course I copy and then I paste. Okay, and you realize that it's, it's actually the same thing that I already I did it for you already. So you can just run this, run this. And then it will say it's like downloading videos. Okay, and then it will tell you that, okay, it's, it's done already like essentially. Let me just refresh it. 
Okay, when I refresh it, you will see that there's this file over here called YouTube DL test video. Okay, if I download it, you'll see that it's actually a MP4 file and I can even play it. Okay, so this is the link that was given this is by a test video. Yeah. This is the link that's given by the, the, the sample code by the developer. Okay, in fact, we can just quickly visit this. And you'll see that it's the exact same thing. Okay, so right now we already just running the sample code provided by the developer. We can already download like a video pretty easily. So, but it's a video. So, how do we download it as an MP3 file? Okay, an MP3 song file. So, again, as a good developer, you just Google. Just ask Google, YouTube, DL, download, audio only. Okay. And then uh, you see like, and then you just go, you just go to like the Stack Overflow link and then you see like there's code here that tells you, okay, to download uh, videos in just an MP3 format, you can just use these options over here. So of course, just copy and then just paste. Okay, so you, you just need to look at the code and then you, you can you just need to check whether it's like doing any malicious things. And if it's not, just run it and test it out. Okay, I'm just gonna run this. And then you say, yeah, you just need to refresh this thing. I think, yeah, it's done already. So you, you look at this over here, You hang on, uh, let me just, yeah. So over here you see there's an MP3 file. So that's where we know. We can download videos from YouTube and convert it to an MP3 file. Okay, so now that we managed to download the MP3 file of like the YouTube of the, the test video, right? Let's do it on a list of videos. So over here, look at this. You see that it's passing YDL download a list of links. So to download a list of videos, I just need to change YDL.download to the list of links we have earlier. And I'm just gonna run it. Okay, and if you look at this, right? Okay, it's, it's still taking a while to download, but I just refresh. Uh, I just refresh it, and you can see that all the files that I want, they are here already. See MP3 files of like the dark song, MP3 file of like this very nice song over here, and you can just click on it, and you can just click on download, and then you can sort of just download to your own computer. <laughs> right. So that's really how easily it is for you to just download a list of youtube videos okay suppose next time like your dad really just sends you like 20 youtube links you can just fit that into this like a uh, notebook just run it and it works and in fact look at this uh, we are running this in a collab notebook right you realize that it's downloading to google server and we need to download it from google server again like click on here and click on download if you actually just run the jupyter notebook the ipymb file you click on download the ipymb file and you run it locally on your own machine's Jupyter notebook, it will just download to your machine immediately. You don't have to like go through this extra step where you click on here and click on download. Okay. And I'm and I am done with my demonstration. Okay, so uh I'll pass the time back to Itao. I think Itao has something to demonstrate. So um, this, this is our last slide. So um, it's basically like, where, where, where do you go after this workshop? So this workshop is like our last Python workshop of the semester. After this, there'll be like other stuff, like uh, there'll be Git, there'll be HTML, CSS, there'll be Docker and React. So, okay, so there's like a, a lot of things you can do with Python. So you can do like web development. So there's in Python, there's like this th 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 party library called uh, Django and Flask. And you can make uh, uh, like games using Pygame. Can uh, you do some data analysis as Chris showed just now with pandas and matplotlib. You also do like uh, what was commonly in Python. Uh, you can do like machine learning using TensorFlow, PyTorch, and you can also like uh, start to work on your own like uh, automation projects. So um, we just like go through like one example. Like it's called a uh, PyFluminous. So uh, for engineer students, like we use like this thing called Luminous and. So sometimes like downloading all the files can be like quite troublesome. Like every week you have to go and like download all the files from all your modules and stuff. So 
Yeah, so um, this this repo PyFilmius will automatically help you download like all the files for all your modules. Yeah, so you can you can read the documentation here. All you have to do is git clone and then like uh, run these few commands. Yeah, so I, I just like do a quick demo. Yeah, so I really set up like I I did clone the thing and I okay. So I, let me just uh, make make my output directory. And so after that, you just need to run this command, and after that, it should. Yeah, and you automatically start downloading the files. So if you go here, you can see like all the files are being downloaded, and this will take a while. So yeah, and if you look into the source code, you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah. So, so like some of the libraries they use is like this thing called ar argument parser. So, so that you can send the command line arguments to the program, and also like you can see it uses like uh some libraries like this. These are this are st standard library. So like uh, requests is like how you uh, access the internet by making like API calls and stuff. Yeah, and then you have date passing and stuff, and. Here we also have Shatil, which is also a standard library. Basically, it's used to copy, move files. And then we have Beautiful Soup here as well. Okay, let me just kill this program first. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you can also like join our other events. Like we have, uh, like we have, a, we have hacker school every week, like uh, until like the second last week of semester. And like hacker tools as well, and also like Friday hacks. So just keep a lookout for our mailing list. Yeah. So, um, uh, you you appreciate if you like how you see out the post workshop survey, so that we know how to improve. And also, if you guys are interested for our next week's workshop, which is introduction to Git, you can sign up in the link here. Yeah. If not, uh, we already slightly overrun. I think we're just uh, hanging around for now. Five minutes to answer questions. Yeah.